Good morning, family and friends. We are gathered here in a somber yet honoring way to remember someone that was very close to us. Walton was a husband, father, brother, grandfather, great-grandfather, uncle, cousin, and a friend to all of us. He touched many lives through the years that we knew him. And the memory stays strong in all of us, especially in his family. It is an honor for me to be here this morning. And through this has been a very difficult year in sadness, but we can rejoice in how God used Walton in all of our lives, as well as where Walton is right now. We celebrate his life and the memories that he leaves behind, but we also celebrate his relationship with our Lord and Jesus Christ, his Savior and our Savior. And we know where he is right now. Walton was born on September 29, 1938, in Baghdad, Iraq. He was born to Nanajan and William. Third child and the first son after Alice and Olga and preceding his brother Martin. He finished Kirk school at Kirkuk, Iraq, and started working for the Iraqi Petroleum Company in the Water Filtration and Treatment Department. He met Nina at a church event, and they locked eyes and remembered each other. And he came back a year later, and he played his accordion with the church music and worship team. And after that, they started dating. They were married soon afterwards on January 5th, 1963. Five years later, he immigrated in 1968 to Philadelphia and then soon afterwards moved to Chicago. While in Chicago, he started working as a mechanic and he was very handy. And somebody noticed that he was extremely mechanical and they recruited him to work um, from skill at, and moved to FMB manufacturing as a tool and die worker. He worked there from 1969 to 1995, and after that he moved to several different companies, always as a tool and die maker, when he retired at age 78 in 2016. He was a hard worker, and nothing was impossible for him. Walton passed away peacefully this last Saturday, from his second stroke. Let us pray. Our Lord, we acknowledge your presence here and the gift of life that you have given each one of us as we place our faith in you and your Son, Jesus Christ. We come before you as friends and family of Walter William. We are gathered as we honor him and celebrate his life with us on earth. And yet his passing with you is one of eternal basis and we are joyfully filled considering that. Thank you that you are a God of mercy and hope who promises to comfort us, particularly when we lose our loved ones. And so in these moments, such as now, in your son's name we pray, amen. Would you please stand with me as we sing our first song? It will be like when I 
He would take it, turn around, and analyze it with care, and with no complaint of being tired, he would break down what needed to be done and how he would fix it. Even though I usually didn't understand what he was talking about, I knew I was learning and continued to learn so much from him. He would usually fix it right there. He never said, I'll do it tomorrow, even when he was tired. The only reason he would say he'd fix it tomorrow is if he had a, to make a new part at work the next day for the item. When I got my place in Chicago, I wanted to install a TV on the wall. This was 2007, and TVs mounted on the wall were still pretty new. So I asked my dad if he could help me install one. He asked to see the wall mount first. So I showed him one on BestBuy.com. He, uh, he liked the design, but he said he could do it much better. And he pointed out the flaws in the design. He even went to Best Buy to look at the wall mount in person. So in about two or three days, he had made his own TV wall mount that he designed himself. And if you want to visit my cells, my house, you can see it's much better than the ones at stores. <laughs> my dad said it would last forever, and he's right. We've changed the TVs twice on it. The design he made on it is so beautiful. Everything he did was, was done to be functional and to look good. Then, uh, especially, uh, oh, I'm sorry. My dad was biased, but he was not afraid to admit when he made something that was better than the original. And this was definitely one of those times. He always wanted to make things better than what they were. There was always room for improvement. He was a true craftsman. My dad loved photography. Our picture, our family's lives were so well documented, as you saw. <laughs> he was great at setting up the camera and getting everyone in position and then setting the timer so he could be in the picture too. The picture was always centered perfectly in the frame. On Saturdays, he often did wedding photography and he did at least 100 Assyrian weddings of relatives and friends. Wedding photography is an all-day affair, and this is after he worked 40 hours a week, Monday through Friday. He took me out one of these weddings, and I remember it was fun for me, but I could tell it was a lot of work for him. This was pre-digital era, and he had to constantly change the film when it ran out, and he did this all by himself with no assistant. But he loved to do it. He had so much energy. And it also gave him a chance to meet new people, and he loved talking and making conversation. He would truly light up a room with his personality, love for life, and storytelling. He always had the latest cameras and would use filters to change the color hue of a picture. So common on the smartphone apps of today like Instagram, but so innovative at the time. He liked to try different photography tricks like taking a photo of someone in one corner and then retaking this, a photo on the same film to add someone in another corner sometimes doing this up to four different sections. He loved to experiment with photography. So you think someone like this who's used film his whole life would probably hate the introduction of digital film, right? Incorrect. My dad embraced digital film and moved on from film without looking back. He loved how easy it was to use and how higher the pixel, the better the quality of the picture. He was always evolving. He didn't let, he didn't look like it, he didn't look like it, it was like a new way to learn how to take photographs. He was excited about the new challenge. Before my dad retired at 78, he had learned how to use AutoCAD. His mathematical skills and new commuter, uh, commuter, computer skills helped take his tool and die making to another level. He loved being on the internet and using the computer, another tool that helped him foster his curiosity. He especially loved YouTube and was fascinated with videos of wildlife and, of course, music. My dad was a musician growing up. He played the accordions back home in, in Iraq. In the 1950s, there was a band called Assyrian School Band. The band was sponsored by the Assyrian School in Kirkuk. They used to entertain guests in, at weddings and parties in Kirkuk. My dad was the accordion player in that band. I unfortunately don't remember or never got to see my dad play the accordion. I don't even know, I didn't even know he still had it until he gave away and got me my first electric guitar that I still have and will always cherish. Music is a huge part of my life and he was so supportive of my musical career. He was always, he was only worried if I would be able to support myself financially. When he found out I got a teaching job, he relaxed and encouraged my musical journey. Along with my mom, they paid for all my schooling. They believed in me.
there was always so much love and support in the house. Later in my life, my dad played the harmonica. He was self-taught, and he could pick up on any melody. A lot of times I'd be in the middle of a lesson at their place, and I would very faintly hear my dad playing the melody to whatever we were working on <laughs> upstairs, and that would always make me smile. He really loved music. He passed along many things to me, but his love of music will always be something I am most grateful for. He was always there for us whenever we needed help. So many great examples, but this one recent sums up how thoughtful he was. My girlfriend Brittany planned a trip to us, for us to France in February 2019. My parents came to visit us the day we were leaving, and by mistake, I ended up leaving my phone in their car. Can you imagine? Leaving for another country in two hours and you don't have your phone. They also didn't have their cell phones on them, so I had to wait for them to get back home to Mount Prospect from the city to finally let them know what happened. Dad jumped back in the car and told us not to worry, and that he would meet us at the train station in Rosemont. When we, exit, when we exited the train, he is waiting patiently, waving to us with a big smile on his face on the platform. It was so cold that day with my cell phone in my hand. He saved the day like he did a million times before. I was crying, so thankful to have a father that would do anything his ability to help. He then, of course, drove us straight to the straight the airport, and I felt like I had the best father in the world. This is just one of the hundred stories like this that my, my dad would do for my mother, me and my sisters, niece and nephew, son-in-laws, and all his friends and family and relatives. Anyone that needed help, he was always there. My dad had a really bad stroke on February 4th of this year. We almost thought we lost him. He lost all memory, ability to speak, and to move. If you ever see my dad, he's very quick and agile. He runs up and down the stairs for an 80-year-old so fast, it's incredible. To see him lose that ability was so hard on all of us. Dad is so active and talkative, he was never at a loss for words. It was a struggle. We couldn't even visit him and only had Zoom meetings. This, as you can imagine, was so difficult on the whole family, especially for him. His thoughts were there, but he was not able to say them out loud. But even early on, when we gave him a harmonica, he would play it like nothing had changed. He was still able to play with no problem. It was amazing. This gave us so much hope. And slowly he got better. He started talking, laughing, crying, and moving. He started to be his own self again. His recovery was nothing short of miraculous. We felt truly blessed. My dad felt like he was ready to leave the rehab center much earlier, but after nine and a half weeks, he was officially ready to leave. When we picked him up, he felt, he felt like he had escaped jail. <laughs> he was so happy, relieved, and excited to be back home with family. When we saw him walking, he was back to his old self. He wasn't using a cane, even though he was supposed to. He was a new, laid-back, relaxed, funny, finely retired version of my father. I knew he would evolve, evolve himself when, again. We were so happy to have him back for these past three weeks. Three weeks we will always cherish in our hearts and minds forever. I was blessed enough to get to spend the last day with him. We ran some errands, and I didn't think of it at the time. That would be a day I would never forget. I wish I gave him a bigger hug when I said goodbye that night, but you never know. Only regret we all have is wish we had more time to spend and talk to him. We all wanted to hear those same stories again. He always had a great way of retelling stories, making them interesting again. I will miss my dad so much. But I'm so proud of him and all of his accomplishments and all the opportunity he gave to me and, and the whole family. He truly lived life to the fullest and he left so much of a mark on all of us. With his beautiful handwriting and craftsmanship, his love of photography and music, his unselfishness, and his wanting to always help his family. His love for life and knowledge and always wanting to better himself. The outpouring of love and support from all his family and friends is a testament to all his life. The sadness and feeling of losing him is huge, but knowing how great his life was makes me so proud of him. I appreciate the life, love, and opportunity he gave me and the family so much. 
I'm so thankful for all the memories in his life who will always live with me forever in my heart, in my mind, in my soul. I love you so much, Dad, and I'll miss you. This is um, a poem I wrote for my dad. <clears throat> A surprise, a new joy in your eyes. Your name choice for me became your prize. Three became four on the same day. Our home, new place, was destined to stay. A house now filled with three of your girls. Your life with us entrusted your world. You blessed us with a mother to stay at home, always happy to fix things and work alone. A baby boy came, our hearts content, to carry your name and represent. Four became five, and our adventures began, weathering life with music in our plans. Many's talents still to be known, took some for granted before I was grown. A love for capturing a moment's time I live to defer and dabble in rhyme. Curious with, with the world, history was king. You welcomed challenge and learning new things. A storyteller fond of family and your friends, devoted to your word and one to commend. Chess and sports were other passions you knew. You taught me the skills and showed me their truths. Consistent instruction while expecting the best prepared me for studies and life's future tests. One by one, each of us moved out to start anew. In my house, a girl came, then followed a boy too. The greatest gift you gave them was your time. The greatest gift you gave me was watching you shine. When I was suffering, you were my rocking voice. You never let me down, always here by choice. In awe of everything you were, and of you there were a few. Everything I do has intention, that's how I remember you. I hear your harmonica playing, I hear your sounds unique. If I am ever lost, I'll follow this melody I seek. Don't trail too far ahead, your gifts are many and rare. I'm not ready to say goodbye not done with you to share. Remember my last request, an angel to us you'll be, to linger on and witness and protect as you need. Never forgotten, unforgettable is what you are. We'll miss my biggest fan. We'll miss my shining star. I'm Luna, I'm the oldest, and you heard some great messages from my brother and my sister. Uh, I'll make mine short, um, and I do want to share some funny stories of my dad. <laughs> um, you know, when he first had the first stroke, we were worried, but when he recovered, we were so happy, we were so blessed. And when he returned home, we didn't take that for granted, we were just so happy. I mean, there were times I would call him two or three times a day because I just wanted to hear his voice. Especially saying, hi, Bratzy. <laughs> but uh, just a couple days after he returned home, he was rushing down the stairs to get the door because someone rang the doorbell and he kind of fell at the bottom. So my mom called me, you know, Dad fell. I'm like, oh, mommy, oh no, I'll come by. You know, not that I'm a nurse, okay, Ashley? <laughs> I'm not a nurse, but I was like, okay, I'll lift up your arm because he kind of fell on his shoulder. But he said he's fine. So I took a memo pad, and because we did a lot of visual things with him when he was at the nursing home, and I wrote, do not run. Do not rush. You know, use the stairwell. And I already heard he started packing, and I was like, do not lift. And I left him that note. Uh, my siblings told me later he hated that note. But anyways, um, so a couple days later, I called the house again because I want to talk to him. And my mom answered. And as I'm talking to my mom, I hear vacuuming in the background. And I'm like, OK, 
okay, I'm talking to my mom, but I hear that. And I'm like, Mom, who's vacuuming? And she said, I said, what all that bad? What can I do with your father? I go, get him on the phone. And I go, because the nursing home told us he has to be careful. So I said, Dad, you are not to vacuum. And he goes, do not run. Do not rush. I don't see do not vacuum. Thank you for everything you do for the family. 
words, capturing your personalities in the words to share about your father. We can see the twinkle in his eye. We can hear the twinkle in his voice from the stories you told. Almost every time I finished preaching here, Walton would greet me in the back, and he would have a little story to tell, a little add-on to the message, maybe a little funny part of that. But we always like to have those moments together. And so it's my privilege to be able to read this scripture passage this morning from Isaiah. And as you hold on to his memory, you hold on to his faith. The great strength of God's word reminding us of the great strength of his presence. And so these words from Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 28 to the end. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God is the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint, he does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray again. Father, we stop and we pause and we recognize the power of your word. You being the author and creator of life. And not only the life that we enjoy here, the life of faith, because as we trust you, we have hope for a future. And so even as Walton is with you now, we rejoice in the reality of that hope. That he does not have to imagine anymore. Did he dance? Did he stand in your presence? Did he fall to his knees? Or did he just be amazed at who you are? Lord, I'm thankful that he could live before you with conviction and strength and leave this great legacy for us to follow. So, Lord, we thank you that you, the great shepherd of the sheep, can be our Savior, even as you are his Savior. And I ask that you, not only being the great Savior, are also the great shepherd. And I pray that you would continue the shepherd Walton's family, that the valley of the shadow of death has come near, and mercy and goodness have chased Walton all the way because he's going to dwell forever in your house to be with you. So thank you, Jesus, for these moments to remember, to reflect, and even to renew our faith in you. Almighty God. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's a strange thing to know that you know someone's family and their background for five generations. And this morning, I finally got to meet Knox, Walton's great-grandson, and that, for me, covers five generations of somebody's life and family. When, we, when I was six years old in Tehran, Iran, all of a sudden, two strange people came to our house, and we had, my brother and I had to move out of our bedroom, and we ended up sleeping on the floor for two years. Well, that was Walton's parents that just moved in with us. <laughs> And I've been waiting 50 years to figure out the connection because I didn't know who they were. 
I kept asking him as a five, six year old, like, okay, what is your connection to our family? But soon after a few weeks, I realized that they were gonna be my short-term grandparents. And as I would ask these questions about the family connection, I remember Walton's mom and dad would take out their photo books and they would show us their children. And I remember seeing Walton's photo, some of those photos that we saw earlier. And you're like in a dream state because when you see him again, as you're making the slideshow, you're like, all that memory is coming back and it's surreal. But this connection goes back. And I remember their personalities. I remember Walton's dad's and his sarcasm. And I remember the amazing, affectionate mom that he had. And also, they disappeared. They were no longer in our house. And they ended up in the United States. Well, we also immigrated here. And by chance, my brother and I decided to go to Carter Church. And what do you see? One day, I see the wedding photo of Nina and Walton live as I'm looking at them at that church. <laughs> and so the circle continued. But you know, when we look at photos of someone, we think about them like, what is that photo telling you? What is the personality? What is that person like? What can you think of? But as a young boy, I saw Nina and Walton show us what true love was about. Not only love for each other as husband and wife, because you never saw them separated. They were always together. The way Walton would help Nina come to church, and they were always sitting in the last fourth or fifth pew over there. They would never move, and they were dependable, like mantles on a wall. And you would always depend on them for to be together. You didn't ask, you didn't have to ask, where's Walton? Where's Nina? They were always together. And the love that they had for their children and their grandchildren and other family members was something that I experienced for 45 years after that. As a young boy growing in that church, Luna and I were in the same youth group. So we did a lot of activities together. And then because we were on both on the same bus ministry, and I took on the bus ministry, I, I would pick up all three of them for church. <laughs> and they lived on 4715 North Abers. I still remember that address. <laughs> they were the first per pickup I had. So that means they su suffered with me for the entire bus route. And yet, they were the one group of people that I really enjoyed having on the bus the entire ride. As you experienced their personality, they love people. And I think that comes from Walton and Nina. They love being with people and showing care. And the love that Walton had for his wife and children was even greater as you got to know him, as he demonstrated his love for his father and his savior, Jesus Christ. I remember our first church picnic. And as an 11 year old, I saw him and, and another man from our church who was Korean playing chess. And I'm like, what are these old guys? They're, they're old, they don't know how to think strategy. I'm gonna play chess with them. Well. By the third move, I was checkmated. <laughs> and I said, how could that possibly be? You know, like, you know, as an 11 year old, you think you know it all. Well, come to find out the Korean gentleman was a national Korean champion for chess. <laughs> that would have been nice to know. But Walton would come up to me every so often I would see him, I was like, Hey, have you been practicing? You know, the church picnic is coming up. So I would have to practice a whole year. And I never got that far. They were superb. He was superb in his thinking, logical skill. And we all remember Walton. We remember his strength, his, his care for people. There was not one bad bone in him. I never heard him say anything negative. I never heard him... 
be angry. You wanted to sit next to him. No matter it was at church or at the wedding, you couldn't wait to like, I hope the seat next to him is empty because he cares so much for people, he will find everything about you. And if he didn't know the topic, he will listen to you talk about different things. He was extremely knowledgeable and the love was felt. But yet this Walton, who retires at age 78, who nowadays retires at 78 years old? I mean, he's like a superstar, right? But there was a frail side of him. And it was that frail side of him that turned him to follow Jesus Christ. It was the frail side of him that knew that he could not solve every problem in the world. He could not fix everything. There were limits to what mankind can do. No matter how much he loved his family, how much he loved Nina, and how much he loved his three children, he realized that the only protection and the ultimate protection and love came from the Father. And so he turned his faith, even at a young age, to his Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is what sustained him. The strong, loving man that we saw was propelled and energized by the love of Jesus Christ. And he reflected that in our relationships. It gave him security to know that his three children and his wife, for all eternity, will be with God. So even though he was strong in the exterior, internally, he was fragile. And the passage that comes to mind for me is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, that talks about jars of clay. Jars of clay that's strong and hold liquid and different material, but they could easily be broken. Walter was a strong man, but he was weak, knowing his limitations, and yet he knew that God could make him complete. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12, it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. I don't know all of Walton's story, but I know that his life was a lot harder than mine. The things that I take for granted now, Walton and Nina did not have. But they were willing to sacrifice to come here to raise their children in a great country and in a loving way. And he never complained because his inner source and strength was Jesus Christ. And that's what gave him hope. That love, that energy he had was the hope of knowing where he was going. The hope that comes through Jesus Christ. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, continuing with the same passage, 13 through 18, it says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that his grace extends to more and more people and may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but things that are unseen are eternal. We lost another great person from a great generation. 
and the mantle has been passed on to us. To have the same faith as Walton did, to have the same joy, to have the same trust and hope. His memory lives in us because it is not his power that was existing in him. It is the power of Jesus Christ. And that is available to each one of us. If we think we are strong, we are weak. Not one of us can go in the presence of God, but the only way is through Jesus Christ. And that is my hope. That is the hope of the family, that all of us will know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then, is the hope and joy we have for Walton, knowing that he is no longer suffering. When Luna called me and texted me about the first stroke, I was devastated, because in my mind, I could not picture Walton in that state. You know, when you've seen somebody for so long, you always picture him as bouncing and high energy, and I could not imagine him not being able to run around move his arms, walk, and even speak. But yet, I think God answered our prayers. He gave us the second hope to say, all right, I'm gonna give you another few weeks to be with Walton and to make quality times with him. My last interaction was closing that gap of 50 years because when I would ask his parents, what is our connection to, to your family? I still didn't get it, but Walton brought the genealogy that he had made, and I was able to make a copy of it. And finally, after 50 years, he answered this question for me. And so now I have the genealogy from my dad's side. And he was delighted. He was delighted to share that with me. And I know it brought so much happiness because he cared for me and he cared for all of us. God cared for all of us in the same way to make us happy. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. There is nothing that we can do. We cannot fix anything to a point that we have salvation except through Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you is now, if you do not know Jesus Christ, take this message today and what you have heard from the family as that second chance to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Because someday, we will not have that chance again. Walton is sitting at the table with Jesus Christ now. I don't know if he's taking photos, I don't know if he's playing the harmonica, I don't know what he's doing, but I'm telling you, he is laughing and he's making everybody around him Smile, because he's sharing of what God did in his life through his stories. He's pointing everything back to God. That's the Walton we know and we love. And he remains strong, and he's not fragile. And this is what God said to Walton. He said to him, the same way he spoke to his son, as we read in Matthew 25, 23, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Better in, enter into, your, into the joy of your master. He is resting. Still high energy, but he's at peace. Waiting for his family to be with him. Waiting for us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ to be with him. Nina, thank you for sharing Walton with all of us, especially with me. I learned so much from you. I learned so much about what marriage should be like. I learned so much about what worshiping God together on Sunday mornings is like. Luna, you continue to make me laugh. 45 years later, you still bring a smile to me. Thank you. And I, I look forward to many decades together. Linda, you were always creative with poetry that spoke powerful words, thank you. And Paul, thank you for being that gentle boy that would always listen to my crazy stories. <laughs> and yet, you have grown to be an incredible man, thank you. Steve, thank you for taking care of Luna. Robert, thank you for taking care of Linda. And Brittany, thank you for encouraging 
Paul. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for your precious, eternal, and unchanging word. We thank you that you are to us the rock of ages and the great I am. In the midst of our natural sorrow, we thank you for the supernatural comfort and grace. In the face of death, we thank you for your gift of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. In the face of separation, we thank you for the eternal reunion we so eagerly anticipate for all of us who have placed our faith in your Son. We thank you for Walton's life here on this earth, and we recognize that Walton is with you now and for all eternity. We celebrate this, and we look forward to being with you as well. We acknowledge that he is seated at your table and rejoicing even now in your very presence and feeling no pain. We rejoice and anticipate for those who know you personally to do the same, same thing someday. We especially pray that you strengthen, sustain, and comfort Nina, Luna, and Steve, Linda, Robert, Paul, and Brittany, Kyle, Kurt, Fallon and Nolan Knox and his brother Martin, as well as Kyle's wife. Father, I pray that you be with Knox, that as he grows, he will also be carrying the same faith that his grandfather demonstrated. Father, I pray that over Walton's sorrow will turn into joy as we consider our relationship with you. I pray this for everyone that's here. And thank you for the gift of Walton in our lives that reflected your love for us. It is in your son's name we pray all of this now. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing our last song.
Be escorting the families uh, out first. 